live with a Facebook live, book live meeting. And uh, hopefully some people will sign in fairly soon so that we are actually talking to someone. Well, for now, we but can talk to each other. We are here. And we can. We always <clears> have something to say. Yeah, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're actually. Is it going out to anyone? So if anybody's like seeing. Well, no, no, just... they'll they'll sh they'll show up. Um, Do you think it's right, there we go. Someone's here. Awesome. We're and good. Several people are here. Perfect. Little, little floating thumbs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's like a it's like a snowstorm of little floating icons that tell us you're there. That's wonderful. Um. So anyway, here we are. Uh, we are doing Facebook Live yet again. Um, this one sort of is about our new product, which is Louis L'Amour's Lost Treasures Volume 2. And uh, we're going to talk about that for a uh, half hour or so. And then we'll take questions and we'll try and keep up with those questions live as much as we can. And uh, if we don't get every question live, I'll go back through and, and try and answer your questions not live um, this later. Is good. So say, hi, John, Tim, Ray, Jacqueline, Wendell, and Jeff. And I'm not going to say hello to anybody else who shows up right now because it'll just get too much. That's great. Thanks for but coming. thank you yeah. for being there. It's nice to know we're not speaking to the void. Yeah. So of the uh, big new Lost Treasures books that look like this or look like No Traveler Returns. Um, this is the last of that of that series. But one of the things that Angelique and I were talking about earlier was that I wanted to also really promote the Lost Treasures postscripts, um, which are in the back of the, you know, newly published um, classic Louis L'Amour novels. Um, and there's a, a bunch of them that were out this year. I think we did six or seven. And, and next year we have um, six or seven that'll be that'll be coming out. And I'm I was going to read out the titles for um, next year. And I just realized that, that my list is not is not correct, because I think we oh. uh, I think we already have the walking drum I think you out. Do too. Yeah. So, I think you do too. so uh, Random House has been changing the order around. And um, and so I, I'm not going to tell you what's coming because I don't know what's coming. Some of it's already out. It will be a surprise um, to all of us. Right. But uh, if you go on Louis L'Amour's Lost Treasures uh, onto the we Louis L'Amour's Lost Treasures website um, and uh, click on the uh, let me make sure I get exactly what it's called here. <clears throat> Click on the middle column, which says the story behind the story, bonus features in finished works. If you click on that column, it'll take you to a list of all of the Lost Treasures postscripts. And um, I'll just want to talk to everybody about exactly what that is. So that's a different, each story kind of has a different story behind it, depending on what I know about it. So the uh, Lost Treasures postscript for Hondo is very much about how Louis came to write Hondo and how it kind of saved his life as a writer and kind of came in at the last minute and saved him from being evicted and being destitute and on the street and things like that. And it really was about that dramatic. It was quite a moment in his life. Um, the uh, Lost Treasures postscript for the Haunted Mesa talks a lot about various different versions of Haunted Mesa that Dad played around with over the years and about uh, doing research and all, all the, the times you guys went out to the desert. Oh, we went out to the desert over and over. We met all of these incredible people, and um, and so there's some great some great stories in there. The Lost Treasures postscript for Down the Long Hills is available for free on the website. That's the only one where we give you the whole thing on the website. And uh, that one is, I didn't know that. yeah, that one is kind of about a, a sequel that dad was planning. And there's some pieces of the sequel um, in there. Uh, so each one of these things has a little different, little different piece. 
Um, it's not going to be out for a year or two, but um, the uh, Lost Treasures postscript for Kiowa Trail is very much about my dad's friendship with Catherine Hepburn and um, and how she, uh, you know, she she sort of uh, inspired him to write Kiowa Trail and write the character of Kate Lundy in Kiowa Trail for her. And uh, so there's each one of them has sort of a different story. And there's even some books of short stories that have a uh, Lost Treasures postscript. So uh, with all of that said, I'm going to turn all this over to my sister and she's going to either say things or ask things or, or I'm going to, I'm going to try and be really yeah. interesting and brilliant tonight. Okay. So I've, I've read all of Bo's uh, notes in lost treasures volume two. I have not read all of dad's work in it yet because I was just got the book last week and it's uh, not short, but I found myself uh, surprised by, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about by the, um, the, the fragments, the pieces in this book are kind of more broad based in some ways than I think than volume one. Um, there's a lot of things that take place in India or Asia or not, not um, that, that are just have a different, a different background. There's a number of, of stories that I just keep seeing these names that come up and I see if there's a treatment for a nonfiction book about even Batuta, which I have a own personal story about dad with, but I, I find that really interesting. And I know that that's something that dad was working on. And I, I wanted you to tell a little bit about um, where the walking drum started and how it didn't get published until it did get published and how dad worked that into being because of where he was at that time in his life when he originally wrote it. Okay. Well, if there's one book, that actually that the story of that book of it coming into being is the same is the story of lost treasures okay it is um it, it is the walking drum so the walk the walking drum is the key to the whole lost treasures series if you're if you're trying to understand louis lamour and what he was all about so uh as most of you know dad wrote for the pulp magazines and he wrote all kinds of different stories. He wrote boxing stories and crime stories and he wrote uh, high adventure stories. And uh, up until World War II, he really only wrote two or three Westerns. I think he wrote his third Western, Law of the Desert Born, while he was still in France before he came home from World War II. When he did come home, the market for Westerns uh, was growing and uh, and Leo Margulies, his very good friend, but also the CEO, I guess, or managing editor of Standard Magazines, um, told him that you know he really needed to write more westerns because the market was moving in that direction. And so, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, although he was writing other things, he wrote a lot of westerns. And uh, he times became very hard, and uh, the pulp magazines were going out of business. And he um, was trying to make the change to writing paperback originals. And during that period, he was able to sell uh, Gift of Cochise to a top magazine. So Gift of Cochise being the Western that became the movie and the novel Hondo. And he was able to sell that, that story to Collier's Magazine, which was a really, really good magazine that paid quite a bit of money. And he was also able to sell the, the movie rights. And this dug him out of a, a big hole. He was, he was nearly destitute. He was so, he, he, was, he was doing so poorly that he would go to the park in the morning so that his landlady would think he would, had enough money to go to breakfast so that she, he was afraid she would lose faith in him and, and throw him out of his apartment. And, uh, and then he broke through with Hondo. He caught an airplane, flew to New York, uh, pitched himself 
very forcefully to every uh, editor that he could find, both in the magazine business and in the book business. And um, really, as the outcome of that trip, he landed three book contracts. So he, uh, and I, that is, that's not the contract for three books. That's he landed an ongoing contract <laughs> with Ace, um, Fawcett awesome. Gold Medal, and Bantam. Right. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> each one for how many books? One book a year from each one. From each one. Yeah, so and, that was his th the beginning of the three book a year. Yeah. And then he eventually got Bantam to take all three books. Um, and that was a whole other story, which if you read the introduction to Blue of the Moors Lost Treasures Volume 2, you will know the whole history of <clears throat> um, Anyway, <laughs> the... Uh, uh, once he had succeeded writing paperback original westerns for a few years, so now we're jumping up from maybe 1953 to 1958, he's written about 12 relatively successful paperback original westerns. Um, he really wanted to start writing other things and branch out and do things that weren't in the western genre. One of the books that he wrote in that time period, along with a lot of things that he started that are in The Lost Treasures, Volumes 1 and 2, um, books uh, was The Walking Drum. So dad wrote The Walking Drum in 1960 and no publisher wanted it. They wanted him to write Westerns. And so he was unable to sell that book for, you know, 25 years or so. And um, he failed to sell many different ideas. Um, one of them was this idea for a nonfiction book on this very famous travel traveler, travel Traveling. writer, a Renaissance era um, Early. Moroccan yeah. guy named Ibn Battuta, who traveled all around the the Muslim world in in those days and did all kinds of interesting. Things, had Supposedly of, traveled much further, much broader than Marco Polo and yes. other guys of, of that era. Yeah, no, he, he, had, he had an amazing, no one's 100% sure that he actually did all the things he claimed he did, but um, he, had, he had an amazing life and travels, or he was an amazing travel writer without actually yeah. going to the places because he was pretty convincing. And, and I'll throw one little yeah. side note in here. Um, when I was in uh, middle ages history in eighth grade, mm -hmm. I had to write a paper on something, someone from that time. And dad said, you should write it on even Batuta. And I'm like, okay, so who's that? And I ended up writing a research paper on even Batuta. Which is probably the you, most complete <laughs> even Batuta Lamour thing it ever got done. Ever. And it came um, out of conversations with him and the research he'd done and, you know, a couple right. of books, but so it, it, it actually seems, if you look at the timing of things, that his being turned down over and over on the nonfiction Ibn Battuta book was what inspired his writing the fictional book, The Walking Drum, which uh, goes to a lot of the same places that the Ibn Battuta did, although at a slightly earlier time, time period. So he seems to have been uh, inspired by this man uh, to write The Walking Drum. Anyway, The Walking Drum didn't sell. He had to go back to writing Westerns, um, which he was fairly happy to do. He loved writing Westerns. Um, but then he started, he thought, well, I can, I can stretch the Western genre to the point where I can write the sort of things that I wanted to write that were outside the Western genre. I can do uh, a mystery like The Broken Gun, which although it's it's a Western, it, it's a contemporary Western. It takes place, you know, in the 1950s. And um, or I can write something that takes place in Europe, like Riley's Luck or parts of Kiowa Trail. Um, I can have various kinds of different characters. I can go back in time to the early frontier to write something like Sackett's Land or Fair Blows the Wind. So he had this plan to start sort of stretching the Western genre to the point where he could do more of the things that he dreamed about doing, but still keep his fans, keep the publisher, keep the bookstores all from sort of freaking out and wondering, 
what he was doing. And why he'd switch genres all of a yeah. sudden. And so, uh, and so a lot of the 1970s, a lot of his trajectory throughout the 1970s was, was doing that. And then eventually, you know, he stretched the genre enough so that everybody, the publishers and the booksellers and the fans were all very comfortable with him going off. And, you know, he was able to sell finally the walk and drum and he was able to do uh, science fiction like Haunted Mesa. He was able to do a Cold War thriller like Last of the Breed. And he really finally, right at the end of his life, achieved the, the goals that he had set out for himself in the um, early 1950s. So there, that's actually the answer to the question, which I have forgotten every detail of, but I think I just answered it. I think you did too. It was it was about the 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 the, <laughs> the stories in here being um, very broad, like as far as oh, yeah, there's different, 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 different genres, different subject different, matter, different subject matter, different, subject matter, yeah. different places, different times. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, when you talk about the the West and you talk about the West being basically post Civil War, maybe Gold Rush to 1918. Well, I no, mean, I mean, what your traditional traditional, traditional westerns, westerns traditional westerns are kind of 1865 to 1898. Yes, okay? it's 30 years. Uh, it's not a very long time period. And uh, and then, you know, and I think the most interesting time in, in the West was actually prior to the Civil War. So if you, you know, I've- there was I, nobody out there. Yeah, I mean, this was really the Wild West. Right, they were really just um, starting to- starting So the, 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 mountain, the Mountain Man period through the, uh, Mexican War period through the era of the, the great era of the surveyors who before the Civil War laid out the transcontinental railroad routes right. and things like that. And and Dad got to write very little about that time period, which I think is is too bad. I, I know he had some plans to spend yeah. to spend more time to spend more time there. But uh, anyway, so uh, that's some of the reason why it's a little, it's a little more broad based. Also, a couple of things to say about this book: there is more finished work in volume two. So, volume two has a couple of short stories and several treatments that are that are the whole thing. They're not just the beginning. Um, volume one had more uh, had more things that were unfinished in it. Although there's a lot of things that are unfinished in this book. There's also some very long. Uh, unfinished sections in this book. There's a, a book about uh, Tibet that's set in the 1970s, um, and there's 17 chapters of that, and there's a, 10 chapters of a sequel to Borden and Chantry, um, and and that uh, uh, you know that's that's quite a bit of that story. It's certainly not the it's certainly not half. Neither neither one of those was going to end up being half the story or even close to it. I think both of them really just um, in movie terms, you'd call both of those sections act one, regardless of how long they were. I find I find it. I, I love reading your commentary. I love reading the Lost Treasures information because um, there's three years between us and he's older. And so, um, so much older, he's older. And mm -hmm. so his memories are different from mine. There are things that he remembers because he was eight and I don't remember because I was five. And it's, it's, it always brings something new to me and something that I remember, but, um, Borden Chantry, the, the one that's in here, the one that he began, he began at the end of his life. So this is, this is the sequel. The to sequel Borden to Chantry. Borden Chantry, yeah. which is in volume two. two. And I, you know, we were all around the house a lot. Dad was ill and, um, and nobody really knew other than us. And he was working on it. And, and he and I had this conversation 10 years before about how Charles Dickens had died in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a mystery. <laughs> And I, you know, and I, there's this little part of me that's always wondered why he chose a mystery to end with, but you know, that would to be the, the last one, but he never thought he was going to die. So there is, there is that. And in the midst of it, um, he, he was, he had these little notebooks and he was typing up the, 
lists of the books for the back of Education of a Wandering Man, which were all the books he'd read in the 20s, like every, because he kept a list every year. And I convinced him to let me, it was the only time to let anybody do anything to a book. I convinced him to let me copy them, to let me type them, so that he could go write his book right. because he was happiest writing and I'm like this is secretarial like this is nothing you're gonna look at it all and he was like but I don't let me I'm like dad just go tell your story and let me let me type these for you and so I sat there and I typed you know uh, up these lists of books it was really interesting though, to see all the like plays and non all the books that he read all the yeah. books that he read and, and the that, breadth of the books that he read those, those lists are on the Lost Treasures website. So if you um, if you go to the Lost Treasures website and go to the section that says uh, website exclusives and pieces of Louis's mind, um, you have to go you have to dig kind of deep into that. But but buried in there, I think it's down at the bottom of the first page. Is a, there's exclusive photos and scans. Oh, there we go. And if you go to the exclusive photos and scans, not only are there a bunch of very nice photographs, but there's also scans of all the little notebooks, notebooks that dad written, uh, written dad in pencil yeah. in like 1925. Yeah. So every once in a while, I'd have to go in and ask him because I couldn't read. Yeah, you know, I, actually, what it was, pretty but almost every, almost every book he wrote or not wrote almost every book he read from 1930 to 1988 is in those lists. Um, and like I said, they're also on the website. The Lost Treasures website, um, I, have a little, I have a little counter on it, so I'm spying on people and not that many people are going there, but there is, uh, there's also a bunch of stuff on the Lost Treasures website that are pieces of stories and Louis notes for various subjects that he wanted to speak about and things like that on that website and those those are not anywhere else so, so it's a really cool website and, and you should free. go visit yeah. and, and you should just, go visit and just go there without you know so I, I, have to, I have to check my notes okay so what as i'm as i'm trying to figure out why i wrote down the bastard of brigham again um i'm going to come up with it in a second um i found um when i started reading that one i that one i started finding a lot of a lot of these wonderful quotes that we're here, but um, there's also a, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, that question, the age old question that comes up, especially where with no traveler returns of where, where dad stopped and you begin. And I never felt in that book, um, which one? No traveler. Oh, I okay. never felt like <clears throat> dad wrote 50 pages and you wrote the other 200. I never felt like there was a line in the sand. It seemed very cohesive to me. And it seemed like if you came, if, like maybe you came in and out of it or you finish it, I couldn't tell. And I, and at one point he offered to tell me and I was like, I kind of don't want to know yet. And now I, now I want to know. And I think that it's, you know, you did such an amazing job and it's such a beautiful story. Um, and I, I feel like, it's time to explain that a little bit right. about where that where that line was and if there was a line. Okay, so so first off, two two di two different subjects. Um, uh, I have on No Traveler Returns. Um, that novel is really a co-written novel. Louis and Bolamore functioning as co-writers. Um, when it comes to the work that I do on something like this, um, I maybe clean up a little bit of it. And sometimes if there's multiple drafts, um, I will put the drafts together to give you um, a single draft that's like the best of, that has all the different interesting pieces of the different drafts in one draft, so you don't have to read it 25 times. <laughs> um, occasionally, I'll do one where there are, I, I put in several drafts and I think they were really different enough and the difference is interesting. But, then then I, I'll offer, you know, maybe three or four different different drafts of something. So can I, can I, I want to interrupt you for yeah. one quick second, and I want to let you go back to this. But I just want to say, Dad, Dad was famous for I, he didn't rewrite. But what he did do, it seems to me, from what we found in the library, was he would restart. He would go back uh, uh, to the exact moment that he started in the book and then start it again. Once he got done writing something, he really didn't want to revisit it. 
ever again. But he might start um, it two or three times. Right. But he might he in the beginning he was well he was very willing to to explore it and do different do different things. It's just once he got to the end, he, he was pretty much done with so it. So it would be like the first it could be anywhere from the first five pages to the first fifty pages. Well, or as you see in some of these, some of these... they go on pretty pretty far. But anyway, um, so in most of the Lost Treasures series and most other things, I haven't gone in there and messed around with with anything. The, the main place where you see that is in No Traveler Returns. And um, so, you know, Dad worked on most of the pages in No Traveler Returns, and I worked on most of the pages in No Traveler Returns. No Traveler Returns has got this very, very, unlike most Louis Moore stories, it has this very interwoven, complex structure where there are all these overlapping stories and um, and it, it was, young writers tend to write more complicated things than older, more sophisticated writers. And, um, and Louis was a young writer when he did it and it had this complicated structure that um, he just, he wasn't pulling off all that well. And I'm not sure how you could have pulled it off particularly well without a word processor or a team of secretaries. It took a lot of backing and filling and rewriting and readjusting little details and going back over it and over it and over it, doing the kind of thing that he didn't like to do once he got to the end of it. And so the, the book had all of these, clearly had all of these goals but he had basically produced a pile of chapters that were like a first draft and the chapters, there wasn't even a clear order for some of the chapters and like which one would go we, where. We have a <clears throat> so, um, you know, I got them into an order that made sense. I recognized that there were, there were certain themes in that book. Okay. All people are connected mm -hmm. is a is a big 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 theme in that book, which I think is kind of fascinating for the time period that he was living in. It was very, it's a there were a lot of all people are connected um, stories in the 1990s, but this this is and it seems to fit that era very well. This is one that was written in the 1930s, so it was way ahead of its time. And um, he was always fascinated with that idea and right. fascinated with. Um, the the it's sort of the background of, of his family and mom's family being in the same place at the same time way back when and that interconnectedness and how people would run into each other right. and well it was a smaller you know it was a smaller world it was it was it was it was a world of you know maybe two billion people and people of different races didn't know one another very well. People of different socioeconomic levels didn't know one very well, didn't know one another very well. Dad happened to work and live in a world in the 1920s, that of a hobo and a merchant seaman and things like that, where he connected with more different types of people than maybe most people came across. That's that's um, something you, you mentioned in here also. And I find that to be I wanted to talk to you about that really quickly. Just dad's upbringing was until he was 15 was in a cohesive family in a small town in North Dakota. And, and in the beginning, at least for his life, his dad seemed to have enough money. He yeah. was a veterinarian mm -hmm. and he, he was, they, they were doing okay until things started to go bad for the farmers. And there, there was actually a depression prior to the depression right okay in the in the 1920s in the early 20s and that wiped out a lot of people in north dakota and a lot of those people were our grandfather's um customers it was uh i remember reading that the first bank that failed in the united states in the 1920s failed in south dakota in 1924. so i so i find i find that to be interesting that all of a sudden here's this kid that gets thrown out into the world goes out into the world and all of a sudden he's traveling all over and meeting people from lots of different backgrounds, not as educated as he was, educated in different ways, um, different lifestyles. You know, I, I just, I, I found that to be really an interesting thought. I hadn't, I mean, I know that, I know that, but I hadn't thought about him being 15 and like 
going to Shanghai and Singapore and meeting people who are Asian that he'd never seen. Oh, I, I mean, he would never seen people who looked like with that. The, with, the ex, with the exception of you know probably a fair number of Native Americans, I don't know if he'd ever seen anybody of a different race. Right. Until until he left home. Yeah. No. I mean, it was a, it was a different world in those days. Very different world. And I remember yeah. him saying to me that when he when he would come back that he realized that people would sort of people who didn't have that education people who hadn't had that experience of going around and traveling that they would they would basically have called him liars if he ex a liar if he explained how somebody lived in shanghai as opposed to a house or singapore or i right. uh, you know borneo or wherever as opposed to how people live in you know oklahoma and new mexico arizona north dakota and and just the different way they ate, the different way they looked, the different way they dressed, and that it was so foreign to anyone who hadn't been there. And we take it all for granted because we see it at the drop of a hat in a computer. You know, we can walk down, we can go on Google Earth and walk down the street, you know, in Hong Kong right now, if we want to. And it was just a different, a very different time. You best let me finish this question. You can finish this question. Because it's past 6.30. Yes, we want to answer um, some. Okay, so, uh, uh, when you're looking at the the kind of things that I did inside um, uh, inside No Traveler Returns, um, if if there are details, Dad was not long on sort of te the technical details of things. I'm sort of the kid who like used to take his car apart and stuff like that. So it's sort of you know it, the uh, No Traveler Returns has a lot to do with the technical aspects of running a tanker ship. And so I got really into that. So there's probably a, a lot of those details came out of came out of my work. Um, uh, Dad lived and worked in San Pedro in the 1920s, but No Traveler Returns has a lot of action in San Pedro, but it's San Pedro of the 1930s. And strangely enough, there was quite a difference. One of the things I discovered when I started doing research was that the, the town had matured enormously. It was kind of like a Wild West town, except it was a seaport in the 20s. But by the 1930s, it was a big industrial port. A lot of that had to do with the fact that the oil business was huge in Southern California. and. Um, and Los Angeles was growing tremendously. So it, uh, you know, I did, did a good deal of work on that. Probably the best example, um, it's a very limited one, but it's a, it's a good example of the type of thing that I did all through the story. Uh, one of the, there were several chapters that seemed like they were trying to be the last chapter mm -hmm. of No Traveler Returns. And one of those ended, instead of writing the end, Dad wrote SK. And it was clearly supposed to be something. I mean, he went down several lines and then centered on the page. He wrote SK. Uh, well, what in the world does that mean? And I, I started doing research and, and I discovered that very, very likely um, he was writing SK because that stands for silent key. And that's, a, that's what a, a telegrapher, a radio telegrapher would send in Morse code when he was closing his station, when he was closing down his station. Um, but it's also something that radio telegraphers, it's a term that radio telegraphers use when they talk to one another about someone who's died. It's like end of watch. It's like end of watch, yeah. It's like RIP, rest in peace. So silent key, it's like somebody, they'll be talking about somebody and, you know, they'll, and somebody will say, you know, I wonder whatever happened to that guy. And then they'll, you know, send, yes. he'll send silent yes. key. And um, that means that station is off the air yeah. permanently. Yeah. And um, so I wanted to make that make sense. Dad didn't do any, he didn't talk about where that term came from. He didn't talk about why he put that at the end of that chapter or anything like that. And I thought, well, that's, and this is like, like I said, this is the kind of thing I did many, many times through this book. So I went back into the book and I built a, a, a kind of a delicate, slowly evolving situation where one of the characters um, is isolated from his family 
and not knowing that it'll ever arrive, he sends his son like a boy's book of Morse code. Mm. And the, the boy then grows up to become uh, a Marconi radio telegrapher. So Marconi was a company that leased the radio equipment to all the different ships and the telegrapher came with the equipment. And um, so they, they came from Marconi. They didn't really, they weren't really part of the ship's crew. And, and he got this job on a passenger liner, which was a very, very good, good job. And at the end of the story, so I'm going to blow it. Spoiler alert. Except, Don't listen. Except, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's called No Traveler Returns, and it's about a tanker ship. So you know what happens. <laughs> um, you know, it's like the Titanic. The ship sinks. This is what's going to no happen. No matter how many times yeah. you watch it. Exactly. It or al- read it. It always read sinks. It always yeah. sinks. And so anyway, at the, um, at the end of the story, the ship with his father, who he hasn't seen in 30 years on it, uh, sinks. And the uh, second mate of that ship gets off a fraction of a message. And the young man is, you know, basically starts sending out messages to other ships and saying, you know, uh, have you heard of any trouble? Was there anything out there? And he doesn't get any answer and he doesn't get any answer and he doesn't get any answer. And finally, after having worked for for many hours, he he shuts down his station, and 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 types in you know silent key. And so that's that's the end of the that's the end of the book. Um, in reality, that's fudging it to make the silent key idea work. In in reality, although a uh, a freighter, a tramp freighter, might shut down its station occasionally and things like that. A passenger liner never would. They would have three or four right. telegraphers and they would keep they would keep the station open all the time they were at sea. So but, do anyway. you want you want to let's see what we've got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because there's uh, not there's <clears> nothing <throat> up here I, I noticed as we were going Well along. we'll I'll go back through the early okay. the early things. So, so we see something? Yeah. Not no we have to go up from here. Okay. So so yeah. you're you're the scroller. Okay I'm the scroller. So you're, it's your well I mean how far do you want to go? Well that, we're gonna go to right now. Oh, okay, and go backwards. I, I don't know. We're just going to do. Okay, it. let's see what we see. Or you go ahead. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking, and I'm gonna like. Thank, she, she thank, thank like you. My, I'm looking to see if there's a question. She doesn't like my mouse pad. So I hate my, his mouse pad. Yeah, okay. I bring my own mouse to <clears> work. <throat> um, I know Louis and Jean Roddenberry had similar world views. Did they ever meet? And if so, what did he think? No, I don't think they ever met, but it kind of wonderfully in the early days of the louislemore.com website, we had a very, very active um, discussion forum. And one of the things that we noticed, and one of the things that I think surprised a lot of people at Bantam was that of the people on the discussion forum, there were a lot of Trekkies. And... um, Actually, we discovered that a lot of Louis fans, at least at that time in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, a lot of Louis fans were not necessarily so much Western fans. They were fans of kind of the paperback original type writing, the, the popular fiction up from, say, you know, 1950 to whenever the date was, you know, 1998 or whenever we were. And, and so they would, you know, they would be, they would read James Bond and they would read Isaac Asimov and they would read Agatha Christie. And um, they just really, really loved the fiction of that, of that era. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pop in here and say one other thing, because I know that, uh, you know, just when you're talking about people like Gene Roddenberry um, and maybe you might have even heard this somewhere while you're thinking that. Um, uh, Dad was pretty good friends with Ray Bradbury. Okay. And so he and he and Ray knew one another. They were both Bantam authors. And um, neither one of them drove. And so they would get out on the street in Los Angeles somewhere, a lot of times in Beverly Hills, and they'd meet at a bookshop, accidentally meet, but they met accidentally dozens and dozens of times times in their lives they would run across one another someplace and then they would walk from bookstore to bookstore or bookstore to coffee shop and talk and then they eventually walk walk home and um 
And so they, they knew one another uh, really quite well. Okay, well, um, Jim Collins is saying, just curious about the library. Dad's library is still together. It's still in yeah. the house. It's <clears throat> it's still belongs to you scroll. Okay. Go up though. You We're gonna go up. Well. Yeah, because okay. there's nothing new that's added right now. Just curious. Did he have a standard word count? Was he a slave to a word count? Or did he write until he had the story told? Are we nano rhymoing right now? Um, <laughs> daily word count and all. Uh, okay, so uh, there's two questions. Yeah, so D Dad liked to write. Um, he, he really considered five pages a day to be a minimum. He liked to get ten. Um, <laughs> the uh, the books of the time were were written to different sizes. So the the standard paperback enlarged itself um, over the years that he was writing. When he first started writing, you know, the books were about 160 pages, 140, 160 pages within a, you know, by the mid 60s, they were up over 180. And then they kind of stalled for a while at 225 before mm -hmm. uh, jumping up to 350 or so, which is still pretty much a, uh, a kind of a standard for a certain type of fiction. And um, how, how much did he hold? I mean, did he, I mean, because the, the question was, was he a slave to the word count or did he write till the story was told? So what do you think of with all the reading that you've done? I think that he liked, I mean, he, he would, I mean, dad wrote until he saw the ending coming and then he sped up quite a bit. <laughs> so I'm it's sure. like a horse going back I'm, to the barn. <laughs> I'm sure that, you know, a lot of his very good fans note that the ending sometimes feel a little bit rushed. And that was He was getting excited about the next book. He was getting excited. Well, he was getting excited about having, about knowing what the ending was. Mm. And he was getting excited about what the next book would be. And um, and so you would you know you would feel things kind of push through right right towards the end. Okay, so we might have a couple of new comments. Yeah, let's, go down. let's see what happens. Um, let's see where are we? Um, okay, I'm it's it's like comments within comments to people. I know. So we can go back up okay. go back up to where you see dad's. Yeah, you can go above this. Okay, we're working this out together here. Um, let's see. Um, somebody was asking about how to say his name. It is Louis because the S it's is silent. Louis, yeah. The S is silent in French. Yeah. Um, that I do know. Okay, let's see if there's anything more up there. Up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just because then we can scroll down really. Because a lot of these are like, which book was your dad most proud of writing? The one he oh, was writing. Yeah, the one. That, well, no, it's <laughs> it's not. That's not really true. Okay. He seems what to have been pretty unhappy with most books right as he finished them. But within a few months, his attitude, his attitude turned around and he was kind of happy about the one that he had finished, you know, he had just finished, but in the, in the, in the closing weeks or even closing days. And it's one thing that you'll see if you carefully read through the lost treasures postscripts of a lot of the older books um, is I, I definitely quote him talking about, about the books a number of times and a lot of times he says he's not he's not that happy with it which is surprising because i never got that feeling from him but when he was writing in his journal and things like that you know his innermost thoughts were things that he didn't necessarily share directly um and then we liked us. reading it when he got it in its form yeah, when it, when would, it showed when it up with a, a cover on it, he was very proud of it. But and and, and he would usually sit down yeah. and read it again. Yeah. And be like, okay, that was that was okay. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This. The, I, okay. So Doug Smith was out. Said, I have a question. One of my favorite books opens with a sentence. I was three days out of coffee, two days out of food, with a posse on my trail. Which book was that? I don't know. I've got no idea. But if you go to the discussion forum on LouisLemore.com and throw that out there, somebody, somebody, yeah. somebody is going to know. Um, this person, uh, my eight-year-old loves Riley's look. I read her down the long hills. What books do you find are well liked by kids? Um, yeah, no, they're pretty good. They're pretty good for for kids. So the eight-year-old is, a, of, is oh, a girl. Yeah. And so um, she and might so, really dig a, a female protagonist, uh, as in um, Ride the River. But yeah, also, a, a lot of younger kids love the short stories as well. 
Right. So there's there's a you know I'm not sure there's a, there's actually a list on the website the louislamore.com website um, that has a uh, uh, there's a list of of short stories for kids on there. I made it up, but I can't remember what's on. And it. I would just and I would just say whatever whatever cover appeals to cover and back comment back uh, matter <laughs> appeals to her. Um, but Ride the River is about a girl who's a sack who's 16. Yeah, so. there are some there are some good female short stories, but maybe oh, not yeah. so good for, for for kids. They're they're a little more uh they're a little more adult. Like Beyond the Great Snow Mountains. Like Beyond the Great Snow Mountains is definitely about, you know, an adult woman with a with so a, she can child, keep with a reading, child. She can keep yeah. reading about the cute guys forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's go down because we've okay, got so like, I'm gonna six go now. I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's see where. Um, Firefly and now the oh that's Mandalorian Paul writing in okay, about that. Yeah, the Mandalorian is kind of a spaghetti okay. western side. Oh ballad. okay, I would love to see a family tree to see how Kerbishard fit into either the Sackett or the Talon family. I I think you would. Do they? To, I think you would have to make that up. Um, <laughs> that's not there, really. There there ended up being a. Sackett family tree in the Sackett companion, but I don't know that I don't know how Louis how serious he was about it because he created a bunch of other Sackett family trees to the point where I don't know which one's the right one. Um, I this, think most of the big the the big moves the the characters who are in a couple of stories are all pretty well worked out, but all the other stuff not sure about it. Let's see, we've got two more down here. Okay, you and your mouse pad. I know this is silly, but have you ever considered licensing your father's likeness for a Funko Pop? They have done George R. R. Martin and have done everything in pop culture to historical persons. I would love. I don't to know own. what a Funko Pop. is. No clue so, what a Funko so Pop we'll is. We'll look it up, but there you go. I discovered his work. Let's see. Okay. Um, oh, well, okay. I discovered your dad's work when my writing instructors at East Texas. Each East Texas state, hello, told us to go read his work, and if we could ever master the intimate voice in our writing, we would be true authors. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's kind of a, that's kind of, no, I like so, the intimate voice idea. Well, and, and I can you know, I can tell you some of where that came from. Uh, Dad was very lucky in that he was able to write for the pulp magazines and learn what he was doing and make money and get encouragement by making money and also by having people enjoy what he did without having to be the absolute best. And he was able to do that for quite a while. He was able to really polish his talent doing that. It's, it's very hard today where you almost have to be a genius from the first moment. It's very hard to find an area where they'll you know, where anything is sort of arranged to kind of let you develop as a talent. Uh -huh. One of the things that he developed was an ability to write uh, directly from his unconscious. And I didn't really understand. I understood it a little bit from him, but it was only, uh, I don't know, a number of years after he passed away that I, th that I began to get this because I had met some people who were doing improv comedy. And um, the thing about improv is you you go through this process where you open up these kind of almost creative doors in your mind and they are they are the portal to the unconscious. And you let that stuff come out and that's where a lot of improv comes from. Um, what's very important is if you stop doing it, you lose it. And it's extremely difficult to get that to open up again. And dad was always very, very concerned about, about how difficult it was to get started again. And so he wrote constantly. I mean, one of the reasons you see how productive he was and you know how incredibly productive he was just writing all this other stuff that we're publishing now, like the Lost Treasures material. Along with everything that was published. Yeah, along with everything else is because uh, not only did he love doing it, um, not only was he kind of obsessive about it, but if he wasn't obsessive about it, um, he kind of started to lose the thing that made it easy. And that it's, it's very important once you start 
doing something like this to write and keep that door open um, because it can be fairly, it can be painfully difficult uh, uh, to reopen. Let's see. Um, let's see. Did John Wayne ever express any interest in bringing any of the other books to the screen other than Hondo? I don't know that John Wayne even knew much about Hondo. I think someone found that story for him, um, and he didn't. He didn't know. He didn't know my dad, and I think that quote that used to be on Hondo, where John Wayne says, "This is the, the best, best Western, Western ever." I don't think that was true. Um, uh, Somebody in his company said. <laughs> yeah. So the, there's there's kind of an insider story to Hondo, and there was. Uh, I, I'd have to. I'd have to look up the postscript to Hondo to get all the names right, so I'm not going to try and do that. But there was an actor who was a, a character actor, and before Gift of Cochise was published in Collier's, um, he was, I think, I guess he was talking to Maury. This is my dad's movie agent. And, uh, and, he, uh, and he learned about Gift of Cochise, and, and he optioned it for... Uh, uh, for a film. And uh, interesting thing is the guy actually lived right up the street here. He lived like a block and a half from, from, where, I, from where I live. Um, and he, he optioned it. An option is when a movie company uh, rents a story to see if they can get all the other stuff put together, actors and things like this. And this guy was an actor and I think he thought he was going to put it together for himself. He'd been uh, mm -hmm. an, an actor in westerns in, in earlier days, but he was a little past his prime, and uh, nothing came of it. But he was a friend of John Wayne's, and within a month or two, there was an agent, um, this mysterious agent, that showed up and wanted to option uh, Gift of Coaches. I wanted a, a new option on Gift of Coaches. And I'm pretty sure that that agent was acting for the Wayne Fellows. So John Wayne, the Wayne Fellows company was the company that made, um, the, the partnership that made Hondo. And um, I think that he was exploring what the price would be because they were afraid that if Louis oh, if learned that Wayne. the biggest star in the United States wanted to make his movie, he'd jack his price up. And uh, and so they established that agent established the price, and then the Wayne Fellows company stepped in, and uh, and and actually option option Hondo. Yeah, I really don't understand your ones. Okay, let's see if there's any any other questions. We are so happy. How to How did answer. the Kilkenny series fall apart? I'm not sure that it did fall apart. Um, Louis wrote a number of stories about Lance Kilkenny. And uh, he he did that, uh, you know, that started off as a as a pulp magazine thing, and some of the Kilkenny novels he wrote, hoping to get into the pulp magazines. But longer stories, it's always two fingers. Um, it's uh, it was always difficult to place a longer story, like a novel length story, into a pulp magazine because it took a lot of space, and. Uh, and so he didn't sell some of them, and so those came out as novels after the uh, after the period that the the Kilkenny short stories appeared. And uh, I think that was somewhat successful for Louis in that in that time period. Let's see. Um, okay, I'm looking to see if we have. You guys are making really nice comments. Thank you, really, really nice comments. Um, we'd love some more questions because you've got us here for another like six minutes or so. <clears throat> so if you've got a question, I'm going to go back up to the top and just see if there's anybody we missed up here that. Whoa, yeah, I'm not really good with it. Just two together. Two together. Yeah. Can't make it go. Can you okay. make it go? It seems to jam right there. That seems to not want to go any further. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to say, but what's the sale date for this? Because uh, somebody said, I'm going to go buy it right now. You certainly can pre-order 
I don't know. But next week. It's. I mean, it's like. I think it's, it's next like, week. It's, it's not like, December. It's oh, now. No, no, no. It's like two, it's two, three, four days away. Oh, okay. Yeah. So no, it's, it's coming. It's, it's coming soon. Right up. Yeah. It's soon. Um, <clears throat> I kind of stop thinking about them after I'm done working on them. So you know, nine months later, when it finally goes on sale, I barely know anything about it. There we go. And let's see what this comment is. Okay. How's your writing going, Angelique? It's going. <laughs> Never ask an author. It's going well, thank you. Um, you can follow me on my uh, oh, and, on my and blog and Paul, see. Paul is writing in tomorrow, tomorrow, except you didn't spell it right the first time. The first time you didn't so, write. So it's on sale tomorrow. Um, okay. Any <laughs> okay? Any new film or TV adaptations? Nothing no, that we know of and, right and, now. Nothing now. And that's you know, uh, it's it's only real when they start shooting. When you're you know? on the set, yeah, no, and I mean, somebody I mean, else I mean, action. Somebody somebody can they can option. Uh, uh, they can option a property and do scripts and hire actors and everything, but if they don't pay you for the book until the first day of production. And the reason they don't pay you for the book until the first day of production is they're ready to cancel it <laughs> all the way Anytime. up until then. So, so the movie business is, yeah. No. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, any additional audiobooks? Uh, yeah, we do t we do two a year, so um, I'm not. Sh I kind of let them. Out. Yeah, I, I let them schedule that because I, you know, one of the. I, I kind of get people to do different things the way I want them to do it at, at Random House, and I I throw my weight around probably more than I should, and and so everything I can let them do on their own and not question, I let them do on their own, so they get to pick. The, they get to pick the schedule. I'm very happy to let them let them do that. Let's see, we have some um, uh, Jim Collins. Um, thank you for asking. Um, let's see. Um, patiently waiting. I always thought it would be fun to have a. I always thought it would be fun to have a book tour, to read a book on location and live that book. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I personally have done that. I love reading a book that takes place wherever I am. So whether it I read The Walking Drum in France, Traveling with Dad. I read, and Mom, I read um, Fair Blows the Wind when we were traveling in Ireland and Scotland. Um, I read uh, A Room with a View when I was in Italy. I love doing that. I, I don't know. I find it really kind of yeah, it's pretty cool. magical right. to do that. So did the writing staff of Gunsmoke ever consult with your dad or ask him to write this year's? No. Um, dad... Uh, Dad sold a lot of story ideas to Tales of Wells Fargo, so I think I think there were ten or twelve of them, ten or twelve episodes. He also uh, sold a couple to the Texan. If you look on our website, you know you'll you'll see quite a few um, you'll see quite a few things. But Tales of Wells Fargo was probably the most um, uh, the most stories that he that he contributed to a television series. He also wrote the pilot for if it had been picked up, what would have been the first Hawaiian private eye television series, which was called Heart of Honolulu. And uh, he did a couple of other, uh, a couple of other things like that. But, um, uh, you know, no, he didn't consult on Gunsmoke. Our mother was on Gunsmoke. Our mother was an actress on Gunsmoke uh, and um, Death Valley Days. Yeah. And uh, so let's see, Margie Wright says, do you prefer hard copy or digital purchases? Which will make you more profit? That's a nice question to ask. Yeah, <laughs> it's a with a hardcover, it's kind of hard to say, but um, our, our the, the royalties on a digital purchase are are very high, which is which is terrific. Um, but the price on hardcover is very high. And so you know, the price on the hardcover is like, I don't know, $28 or something. It's pretty expensive. And um, we make the least money on a paperback. Uh, and I think that there's, uh, I've never really sat down and sort of said, okay, exactly how many bucks do we make off a hardcover versus how many bucks do we make off a, the, you know, we make more money off the hardcover. Okay. But so it doesn't matter as long as you buy the book and you're, and you're happy with it. That, that's the, that's the really important um important thing you know if you want a book that's going to be around forever then the hardcover is great if you want a book that is going to be something, something, something you can carry around easily then the electronic or you can buy great. both which i have <laughs> been known to do in my life that's, um, that's bordering on hucksterism that's i'm sorry but i have done it for other authors actually i have done it 
Um, okay, well, Bruce Johnson, <clears throat> uh, my ex-boyfriend, uh, just said, please let everyone know how wonderfully funny your dad yeah, would be. Yeah, he was a scream. He was, yeah. he was definitely funny. Hey, Bruce. Hey, Bruce. Um, let's <clears throat> see. Uh, asking to be supportive of author's work, so I wonder which is better for... Okay, that was good. Yeah. Um, what was Louis' favorite Western film? Jeremiah Johnson. Hands down. Oh. Yeah, pretty much. I okay. think I think he just... I, I'm not sure that it was his favorite. I think it was a movie that he thought was... Uh, it was like life in the West. It, now, Dad didn't write stories like Jeremiah Johnson. He liked a little more adventure and finding the gold and meeting the girl and doing all kinds of stuff that were a little more romantic and and things like that. So he when he when he would say that, I, he wasn't saying this is the kind of movie that I'm sure he would love to have had a movie like that made. But I think he was mostly remarking on the fact that it seemed very um, it seemed very realistic. He was extremely happy with the way with how quiet the movie could be that it, it, it did a lot of things without without that talk works. yeah and it, it really kind of got into a, a man alone in the wilderness and it was also about that time that i was talking about that's not covered in westerns very, before before the very Civil much War. yeah it was in the mountain man era which is very interesting so let's see i, I jim collins says i know maverick adapted one of your dad's stories i yes there was there was a maverick there's a maverick episode, episode? yeah and there oh. might even have been more than one um, oh that's interesting yeah so it, was it a treatment that he wrote? Like he wrote this? The it, you know, it's like, it's hard to tell sometimes because they put different titles on them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it was a if it was a short story that he sold them, or if he wrote them up an oh, idea, or yeah. if he had an idea for a short story and instead of bothering to write it all up as a short story and sell it, he just had it sitting around. I'm not sure, uh, but but yeah, and he was kind of friendly with Jim Garner. I don't think that's how that happened, but I think they met afterward afterwards though. Um. Still looking for a hardcover of Traveler, Tim Johnson is uh, website, right? Oh, go, or, go, go to LouisLemore.com. Yeah, LouisLemore.com. Everything is for sale. You know, uh, everything we've got is for sale on LouisLemore.com. We will be happy to sell you Books, a hardcover. Audios, the whole yeah. thing. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, so um, John Prejean said that that dead guy that pack saddle episode. affair. That's the answer to one of those television episodes we oh, were is talking it? about, but I can't remember which one. Maybe it's uh, oh, very cool, very cool. Maybe it's Maverick. Okay, have, so let's I'd see. have to look it up. So John Prejean says, uh, when I was in grade school, all through high school, I was made fun of because I had a hard time reading aloud in front of people because of that I quit reading for a good chunk of time. It was your father's books that brought the spark back. Oh, that's great. I love hearing that. That is that yeah, is absolutely. such a wonderful thing. It always makes us so happy to hear about the about people being encouraged to read because of his work. Um, let's see, I'm looking to see if there's anything. I think we're kind of, um, we're, we've gotten it after seven. Okay, well, we'll shut it down in a minute or so. If anybody's got any more questions, fire them off right away. I'm gonna say, Someone here said, my grandpa read Zane Gray, and I read your dad's books. An interesting thing about that is Zane Gray started writing about the time that our father was born, around 1908 or so, uh, maybe even a little bit before that, and um, what made, a, made a lot of money. And uh, he lived here in Southern California, and he had a, um, a fishing boat. Although to call it a fishing, it was like a two or three masted sailing ship. Oh, okay. That was down at San Pedro. That was that was berthed down at San Pedro, and uh, at one of the things with sailing ships is one of the things that gets worn out on a sailing ship is all of the cordage, basically right. all of the rope on the ship that helps keep the masts up and everything. And um, and one of the the managers of that ship who, who was taking care of it for uh, for, the, for Zane Gray um, hired a couple of guys on the dock to re-rig the Fisherman 2, which was Zane Gray's ship. And one of those guys was dead. <laughs> okay. So our father rigged Zane Gray's ship. They never met or anything like that. But um, well, sir, I, I met his <clears> granddaughter. <throat> When we first moved into our house, I met her. Yeah, and she I, lived and in the I, neighborhood. I, I talked to Lauren Gray, his, I guess, son, um, 
a number of times. He was quite a bit older than me. Is there a list of forthcoming uh, LT postscript novels? Well, How yeah, far I ahead? was I was gonna I was gonna read that list, and I'll and I'll read it, but it's wrong, okay? Because I know a couple of them have already been published. So when I originally uh, laid this out, uh, the 2020 list was going to be Taggart, The Keylock Man, Comstock Load, Passing Through, Ferguson Rifle, Lonesome Gods. Walking Drum, and then the 2021 schedule was going to be Kiowa Trail, Tucker, Utah Blaine, High Lonesome, and a few others that I've just finished. But they've already they've already gone in there and and published a couple of those, and I think they probably didn't publish a couple that I had laid out for 2019, and those probably Pretty got substituted over. in into 2020. I asked them to move the Walking Drum and maybe a couple of the other ones up because people had really been asking oh, for walking it. drum. Yeah. 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 And so when I got done with walking drum, I said, Oh, can you find a hole in the schedule for this and, and move it up? And so some things got sorted around. It's like the sequel to walking drum and the sequel to last of the breed are two of the more, most often asked questions, questions about yeah, dad's work, unfinished work, let, you know, and then um, if you go, to the Louis Morris Lost Treasures website, everything that is published and everything that is about to come out that's shortly going to come out is is on that site. So you can you can see what you know you can see what's there. Um, so like I said, that was what I thought was going to be happening, but that's not exactly what, what's happening. Things change. Yeah. So um, so we're at seven. Oh wait, there's a new comment. Let's see if it's a question or a comment. Thank you so much. Everybody's <clears throat> so lovely, and I'm reading everything. I'm just I'm just sort of skimming for anything that is a question because we're going to end that. And I just uh, thank you so much for all your involvement tonight. You've had some good questions and you've made some really lovely comments and told us some really nice stories about finding dad and reading dad and all of that. Um, Bob Feller says, I, I read so many of your dad's books. My friends call me Louie. <laughs> okay. I like that. Okay. I like that. That's good. And no, I didn't name any of my children after my father's characters, but anyway. nobody asked that question, but I just sort of threw it in there. Yeah. So let's see if there's anything else. No, it looks like we're, um, unless we can get yeah, to well, them. Like everybody seems to be enjoying it. That's all very good. They're thanking um, us for doing it. They yeah. want us to do it again. Well, we, we will do it again. I'm going to, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try and do another one of these um, in, in a few weeks uh, in, in early December. And uh, we will, we will hopefully, if everything works out correctly, be doing that from New York and, and I will have a, a mystery guest. So the next, uh, the, the next Facebook Live will have uh, a mystery we'll guest. Have, we'll have, if it's we'll a, a, if it's from New York, it will have, we'll have a mystery a, guest. A New York mystery guest. Um, so anyway, uh, take care, everybody, and, and we're going to sign off. And I'll skim back through the comments, and if there are other questions that seem like they need to be uh, answered, I'll jump in and and the, them. and the book goes on sale tomorrow. Right. So you too. And if, if anybody, um, uh, you know, if anybody has other questions and you don't feel like we've gotten around to them, uh, certainly Ask you know, I've got a email address on the louislemore.com website, or uh, you can go to the discussion forum there, either one, and I'm perfectly happy to answer anything. So any we'll, chance your mom will join you next time. Well, we would like to, I'd like to get her. I'd um, like to get her. Too. Yeah, I'd like to get I'd like to get her to do one of these. We've we've talked about that. Um, we just haven't done it yet. So we'll see what happens. Um, anyway, hope you're very good and uh, have a good night, everybody. Night.